morning, our text comes to us from Ecclesiastes. It's uh, part of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. We're looking at chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. There is a time for everything, a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Uh, Friends, um, I'm sure that you have um, seen the news or heard about um, the shootings uh, in the middle of Odessa area. Um, It's our second mass shooting in the state of Texas in less than a month. Um, I thought we might just take a moment, since it's the right time to do so, And we might enter into a time of silence followed by a word of prayer before we continue with our conversation this morning. So let's be in an attitude of prayer. Holy and gracious God, it is sometimes in the stillness of the moment that we can feel the weight of the world around us. But it's also in the stillness of that moment, God, that we seek to hear your still, small voice. God, we would pray a special outpouring of your Holy Spirit on the families who have been affected by this weekend's tragedy. That we would pray that you would be with those who have lost loved ones, God, that you would be a part of the healing process for those who are still recovering. God, that you would do some kind of work that is even greater than that, that there would be a revival, not just in our churches, God, but a revival that takes hold in the world around us. God, that you would be able to once again call peace out of chaos, that you would calm the storms and bring violence and things that are not of your design and nature to an end. God, for us here today, as we remember our brothers and sisters around the state, God, we would pray that you would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the word that you have for us. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So we're on this journey talking about communal life. Um, whether you call it marks of discipleship, uh, marks of a biblical community, however you look at this, there are some things that I believe are inherent in um, gatherings um, such as those that we find in churches, or at least I would hope that they would be present in those gatherings, that we would get a sense of what it means to love one another in deeper and more meaningful ways, that we would also learn what it means to love God in deeper and more meaningful ways. That we would have the right heart when it comes to service and we'd be serving for the kingdom and for the right reasons and in the right ways, um, not under our power but under God's power. Um, That we would look at life completely differently. Um, If we're engaging the Word of God and we've got it all stuck up here and it never goes that longest distance of 18 inches from our head to our heart, um, I I fear that we won't have the transformation that God intends to have with God's Word. Um, So we look at these things to see where we might be able to recognize the areas where we're doing well, um, but that the Holy Spirit would move in those places and help us grow in the places that are lacking. So this morning we're talking about celebrating. Um, Anybody here love a good party? Wow, so the party animals are the first service? That's insane. Um, They got up early and everything and got here. Okay, so there is this kind of 
nature of celebration in our lives. I mean, we do things that are kind of naturally celebratory. Um, one of the things that we do frequently is birthday parties, right? Yeah. 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 Anybody with a parent ever had to go to Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah. It's only a celebration for some of the family. Um, there are places like that called It's and other places that maybe you've had parties. Uh, maybe you've gone to a park and, or water pad or something like that and had some kind of celebration related to um, the birth of a child or a loved one uh, or even a friend. Um, we celebrate births not just in birthdays but with baby showers. Anybody been to a baby shower? Anybody been to a wedding shower? Anybody been to a company work party? Oh, oh, that's where we're celebrating. Okay. Um, there are a variety of ways that we celebrate in life. Some of those ways in the West we take for granted. Um, part of our purpose, part of our design and communal life in a biblical sense is that we would be present with intentionality with the people around us. Now, this is going to mean family and friends. This is going to mean people in the church building. But this is really starting to open ourselves up to be fully present with all of those in the world around us. I'll give you, a, for instance, a number of years ago, Tony Campolo was um, talking at a, at a conference. And he had spent, I don't know if you've ever done a Christian conference. Those things last all day long. It's not a bad thing, but it can be exhausting work, right? Because you can start with sessions at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning and go all the way through sessions at dinner time, and then come back for worship and small gatherings and things of that nature. Well, Tony had been at this conference, and he had been working long, hard days, um, and he was going back to his hotel room. He just wanted to kind of settle in and get some rest. He was kind of worn out from the day. And so he went in, settled in, laid down, went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, about 3 in the morning, he got woke up out of nowhere. Um, now, he would say this day in hindsight that it was probably the activity of God that was getting him up out of bed. There was a prompting of the Spirit that was moving. And so he got up, and not being able to go back to sleep, he got restless and started to meander about the area. Oh, did I tell you this conference was in Honolulu? <laughs> Anybody want to go plant a church in Hawaii anywhere? We're leaving in five years. Just stay with me, okay? We'll do a church plant there. Um, so he's um, looking for something. Since he can't go back to sleep, he figured he'll get some food. And it's 3 a.m. in the morning, and he's looking for eggs and bacon. Um, all the places that he's finding kind of on the main drag are closed. He finds this dive of a kitchen that is just like a little ma and pa place. Uh, the owner is the cook, and his wife is working back in the kitchen with him. Uh, and he goes in there. He's not real sure he wants to order eggs and bacon, so he decides, based on what he's seeing, have y'all ever been in one of those places? <laughs> so he decided that he's going to take his risk, not on the eggs or the bacon, but on a donut and a cup of coffee. And he's sitting there enjoying his little 3.30 a.m. at this point snack, and in come these... Um, these women. Now, I, I want this to remain a family-friendly service, so I'm going to test out a term with y'all. If I say ladies of the evening, do we understand what I'm talking about? Um, this group of women of the evening came in after a night and a morning's worth of work, and they are just having this conversation, and, and Tony's sitting there with his coffee and his donut taking it all in. Um, one of the ladies' names was Agnes, and Agnes said that the next day was her birthday. Um, and one of her friends, in the snarkiest, most sarcastic way, said, Well, what do you want me to do about it? You want me to throw you a party or something? And that kind of hurt Agnes's feelings. And Tony just held on to that, and they had this conversation that went on, the ladies did, and as they had their drinks and their snacks and went on about their business to go home or go back to work. Um, Tony went to the guy that owned the place and was one of the cooks and said, hey, uh, do these women come in here every single morning? He said, yeah. He goes, well, what about that one that was sitting like really close to me, the one named Agnes? Does she come in every single morning? And the guy said, yeah. And, and Tony said, I want to throw her a birthday party. And the guy looks at Tony kind of funny, and he's, you know, playing with his spatula on the griddle and just not real sure what to make of it. He hollers back at his wife, hey, honey, 
this guy wants to throw her a party. Oh, she comes running in. She's got these gifts of hospitality and, and, and all. She's just so excited about helping Tony with this party. So they agree and work it all out. And so Tony goes about his business. The next day he goes to the conference. He leaves. He takes a little nap, goes to um, the little dive again. And this time he brings streamers and poster board and all kinds of things. Uh, the husband and wife team had made a cake with Agnes's name on it. Um, the guy who worked the griddle, he was getting the word out on the street. Um, by 2.45, this place was chock full of women of the evening, shoulder to shoulder. They were everywhere. There was tons of them. And so about 3.20, 3.25, Agnes comes walking in with her little clique of friends. Um, and right at the right moment, they all did it together. Happy birthday! And the place just exploded with noise and with celebration. And in the midst of all this joy and laughter and, and partying, Agnes just starts to have her face roll with tears. She had never, ever, ever had a birthday party. For whatever reason, because of poverty, because of disconnect, whatever the case may be, she was never afforded a party that she could remember in her life. There was a cake, and she looks at the cake, and everybody's shouting at her, cut the cake, cut the cake, we want to eat it, you know, we want to, let's get this party started, right? It's not good until the food gets divvied up, right? And, and so she's looking there at the cake, and she's just wanting to relish it for a while, and she asks the guy that owns the joint if she can just not cut it for a little bit, if she can hang on to it, and maybe even take it with her. And, and the guy said, yeah, Agnes, sure, go ahead, take it with you, take it home if you like. That moment, Agnes took the cake, picked it up, and walked out with it, holding it like the Holy Grail, <laughs> out the front door, down the block, just a few houses, just a few doors where an apartment was that she lived and we find out after the fact that that's where she lived with her mother, who she was caring for, and she wanted to help mom enjoy the celebration by bringing her the cake and showing her how beautiful it was. Now, all of this is, is crazy insane, and there's probably a, an evangelistic nature to that story. Um, the cook did ask Tony, hey, because um, they were praying after the party, the whole group, and Tony prayed for the whole group, and um, the guy that owns the joint said, hey, you didn't tell me you were a preacher. Uh, what kind of church do you preach at? He goes, well, I preach at a church that throws birthday parties for women of the evening in the middle of the morning. <laughs> so there is a point there, but the bigger point is that Tony was present enough to pay attention to what was going on around him to help somebody that was a child of God realize that they are worthy and they are valued and that they too deserved a party like anybody else. It's a message that spoke volumes into Agnes's life. Um, this is one of the many ways that we can celebrate. Um, this is why churches that are planted in Hispanic communities often, regardless of the context or nature of their own demographic, they'll host quinceañeras because it's a place to mark time together. It's a place to celebrate milestones. Now, these milestones aren't always joyful, right? They're not always something that is at the top of the charts off uh, the register kind of thing. Sometimes these milestones have to do um, more with end of life than beginning or middle of life. Um, my very first appointment, uh, I was just a few months into it, um, and I'd met a couple by the name of Jim and Wanda Blackman. Uh, both of them truly saints of the church, folks that had um, done ministry for most of their seven decades of life in, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, as soon as they were old enough to walk and talk, they were doing things to, to help out in the church. Um, Wanda had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and had um, had the cancer metastasize and, and go to other places in her body. And um, by the time I met them, she was not doing extremely well. Um, she had been suffering for, for some time, um, but she was a fighter, and she kept on fighting, and, and I did learn from Jim um, maybe how to be a better husband and how a loving relationship looks after five or six decades. I, I learned um, about what it means to really put the other person in front of you and ahead of you. Um, he would do things like get Wanda dressed, and then he would carry her from their bedroom out to the living room to where they, she could see and get the light from the bay windows. 
Um, he was intentional about feeding and caring for her and doing all the things that we would expect a, a, a loving spouse to do. Um, but you hear about stories like that. It's very different to be in the middle of it and to see it unfold. It was a beautiful thing. It was a real gift to watch. But that's not the part that really shaped me, um, it, not in the sense of celebration. As Wanda was nearing um, her last days with us, she um, got to the point where she wasn't able to be moved anymore. Um, she was restricted to her bed, and Jim would have me come in daily and, and just visit with both of them. Um, but he taught me how to truly celebrate life even in the midst of a valley. Uh, you see, Wanda loved the old hymns. She hadn't been able to get to church in a number of weeks, uh, several months at this point, um, with any kind of comfort or ease or frequency. And so Jim invited me into their master bedroom, and Jim sat on one side of the bed, and I sat on the other, and we both held one of Wanda's hands, and we sang. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It was in the stillness of that hymn that her whole face lit up. Some crazy person like me singing off beat, off key, and occasionally even getting the words wrong because I lose my place because I didn't have a hymnal in front of me, right? <laughs> changed was a part of her countenance changing now i know that was god working in us and through us it wasn't anything that i did my own power but in that moment i learned the meaning of celebrating life even when it's in the valley you know, it should make no it should be no surprise to us that when we open up things like the book of worship for the methodist church that funerals are called celebrations of life and that the liturgy, if we use the liturgy that are in those words, it calls us to not only celebrate the life of the loved one who's gone on to glory, but to also witness and celebrate our faith. So celebration becomes this ministry of presence that we learn to do in deep and meaningful ways in our small groups, in our churches, and in our communities around us. You know, what would happen if we could take another step deeper into celebrating? What would happen if we could pay attention to, to more of what was going on and then actually make it important enough to rejoice in? You see, there is this young person who was involved in the summer programming here at Parkway who was not doing the things that the other kids were. In fact, this one little child was a little bit rebellious, as I understand it. They wouldn't engage in the, the, the reading of Scripture. They wouldn't engage in the memorization of it. Uh, we thought for sure that this kid got absolutely nothing from all the programming, money, effort, time, energy that had gone into the program. And as they're wrapping up and they're surmising at the end of the process, um, and all the kids are reciting their memory verses, this young child steps up and comes up with a memory verse like that out of nowhere. Friends, we planted a seed and it sprouted. That is worthy of celebration. That is worthy of celebration. <laughs> All right. We're going to have to work on this call and response thing. It may not be in your tradition, but it is Methodist as far as Methodists go back. In fact, I, I won't scare you too much, but we were the original charismatics, so just... All right. I know. Anybody need the bishop's email address? <laughs> oh, I joke. But we can learn to celebrate the highs and the lows. Uh, we've got... A friend that right now we need to celebrate her healing uh, she just went through knee surgery and we can support the family with our prayers but you know there's this whole other part of presence remember that vow prayers presence gifts service and witness there's a way that we can minister with our presence when they can't be in worship um, what if we signed up for the meal train to help provide meals for folks as they have loved ones who are recovering. Um, if you don't know what the meal train is, it's really a cool gadget. Some of y'all did the meal train for Erica and I when we were coming to Parkway um, for our first few nights here before we had all of our appliances hooked up and got fully moved in. 
Um, and it was a huge blessing. Um, we don't do that meal train just for people that are, you know, coming and going in the pastoral office. This is something that we do for those that have had surgery or that need the help for whatever reason it may be. Um, it is a great opportunity to celebrate that person's faith journey, celebrate their wholeness and their healing, to celebrate and actually give back to them in ways that are um, really vital in communal life. We have other families that are just, we need to celebrate the healings that have taken place from surgeries that have happened over the past week. Um, There are so many ways that we can celebrate differently. A celebration is really about marking time together. Um, In the Jewish tradition, the way that they used to do prayers is they keep prayer logs, and, and so they would go back and revisit them from time to time to see where God had acted and moved and, and they would rejoice in where God had said no, and they would rejoice where God had said yes, and they would rejoice, celebrate every time that God did something in response to the prayers of the people. Celebrating is important. We know that we've been through hard times in, in our life in the almost 20 years that Eric and I have been together, and it's been the people that have walked through the valley of the shadow of death with us from our small group or from our close friendships that have really gotten us through those times. It is them that were there when our child was born. It is those folks that were there um, when we've lost jobs. It is those folks that have been there through all that we needed. So celebration, friends, is, is hugely important in the life of the church. 